All right, Richard Thiem, um, speaking today on how it's important for leaders to be hackers. Um, this is reprising his DEF CON 1 keynote. Um, he's rethought this topic and uh, has some ideas to share with the audience today. Thank you for coming, Richard. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be, be here, uh, wherever here is. It's uh, Zoom on top of cyberspace. Uh, and, and I wish I could be in, uh, in Iowa with you. Uh, but next year in Jerusalem. Uh, yes, John I said it was 25 years ago that you did a talk called Hacking as Practice for Transplanetary Life for DEF CON 4. That was my first DEF CON. And I have spoken there uh, for 25 uh, straight years with only a couple of misses. And when he asked me to do it, I looked back on the talk and it really did predict a lot of things or say a lot of things were coming that were absolutely uh, borne out. Uh, I have a good track record at seeing the future much more clearly than I can see the present. And when I revisited, I asked myself, what is it I would wanna say about how much things have changed as a result of everything that I identified 25 years ago coming to be and then all kinds of other things on top of it and i realized that things have fundamentally changed to a completely different level of operation and to be a hacker is a totally different operation than it was 25 years ago the skills and approach and thought world may be the same but the evolution of a meta system uh on top of what hackers and others built over a quarter century uh, has, has made the necessity of thinking differently um, compelling uh, and imperative. Now, thinking differently is something you're going to hear a lot in talks and from leadership and so on. Uh, thinking differently is very easy to think about, and it's easy to talk about, but actually thinking differently is really hard. And that's what I want to uh, approach today. I want to look at what it really takes. Uh, when we're facing a set of conditions uh, that suggest the future is not what it used to be, and we do need to think differently about it. Uh, so I'm going to say my main thesis in several different ways, because it really is going to be tricky to get our minds around it and get a hold of it in a way that might be useful. Well, here it is. We need to think about security, not only in the detailed and specific ways which preoccupy professionals in the field, but at a meta level. We need to think at a meta level because the meta level we have created is thinking about us. And it is not concerned with us in the same way that we are concerned with it. Uh, the meta level is the source of our thinking and behavior in many ways. It inflects us it shapes us, it assimilates us. So the machinery, the network uh, is thinking in its own terms and that presents unique challenges. And if we don't meet those challenges uh, by really thinking about them, the playing field will not be level and it will be tilted in the favor of the machine, not us. The bottom line is Skynet does not need killer robots if it can take us over as easily as the Russians took Crimea without a single shot being fired and with soft power. Skynet is here, but it operates not with a bang, but with a whimper. Okay, so what did I say 25 years ago? That'll be the touchstone of uh, how I proceed. The digital revolution was eroding borders and boundaries. And one result was that the real sources of power and influence that inflected our behavior was no longer national, it was transnational. I did a talk many years ago, uh, the uh, chief officer of the FBI office in Chicago was there, and I was talking about boundaries going down and borders going down, and uh, that this was going to, I'm being distracted by someone staring at me out of the other side of the screen. I'm not sure what's going on over there. Uh, but that's the nature of Zoom, I guess. I, I'm left looking at a pipe that looks like an oxygen hose uh, to the very machinery I'm describing. Uh, at, at any rate, I talked about how you couldn't count on a national and patriotic 
motivation any longer. And the FBI uh, chief uh, agent said, you know, bingo. He said, we used to be able to recruit people on the basis of patriotism, and they would always be glad to help us. And now what I hear more and more, he said, was, I would like to help you, but. And that but was because the transnational entities that were emerging as powerful uh, superseded nation states. And as much as people like to think of themselves, especially today, as Americans and patriotic Americans, the, the fact is that our behaviors, uh, think of Apple, think of Microsoft, think of the big banks, they're international. And they are not concerned with individual countries, except in so far as they need to uh, mix and match a variety of sets of laws and regulations. So Apple in China is different from Apple here, very moral country here in China, wink, wink. Uh, you wanna do business in China, you have to ignore your moral scruples and what China is doing. And meanwhile, China is taking over companies all over the world and then exercising the same kind of censorship that they do at home, uh, harmonizing the society through digital technologies uh, all over the world. Um, a Chinese company owns AMC, the chain of theaters. And you tell me next time you see Richard Gere or Lady Gaga show up at a theater uh, owned by AMC, i.e. owned by a Chinese international conglomerate. So. I'm gonna outline the big issues. And if we look at them and say as a society, well, those are so big, oh, oh my, we can't do anything about that. Then all we will do, especially in information security is continue to tweak the systems we are already using, which constitute a paradigm for behavior and operations. And we will miss that the defense is to protect the perimeter, which no longer exists. As you know, it's a coastline with a thousand bays and inlets. Uh, not a single unbroken um, circle around, quote, us, unquote. Uh, we have to make the systemic fundamental changes we need. Uh, one example, of course, is climate change. I hope I don't have to point out that the intensity of storms, rising sea levels, water wars, droughts, fires, et cetera, um, are a function of climate change, which is going to profoundly impact national and international security but we say, oh, well, climate change, that's so big, we'll never get green enough uh, and, and so on. But if we don't, we're just gonna keep bailing out basements in New York every time a storm happens, instead of dealing with the systemic causes that make the necessity of security and information, uh, uh, information security uh, necessary in the first place. Okay, so this talk is gonna be about expanding your consciousness I really mean that. It might sound a little new agey and woo woo uh, here and there, but it's really not. It's about using all of your brain and all of your faculties, uh, including different parts of your brain, including different modes of consciousness to enhance your habitual modes of cognition and understanding because you're engaging with computer networks, not just through the cognitive artifacts you know in your brain but through a whole field of consciousness. Uh, it's the field of consciousness that we fundamentally are, not that we have, but that we are. And the network is a field of consciousness with which we engage electromagnetically, but also I'm gonna suggest in other ways. And it covers the earth and it goes out to the moon and the Lagrange points and asteroid belts who are Chinese are on the dark side of the moon and we're on Mars and we're exploring planetary systems and soon we will be out of our solar system and our explorations beyond the merely visual identification of planets likely to harbor life in addition to our own. So this is the challenge we have to meet. The extended network and you as a collective are fields of consciousness engaged with one another and that requires you to identify them on a meta level and think differently. Now, what do I mean by thinking differently? Let me give you an example from a different world. Um, and it points out how difficult it is to make that pivot. This woman named Elizabeth Lloyd Meyer, she was a scientist. Uh, she had all the accoutrements of a scientist, rational, uh, distrusted anything but materialism. She taught in the psychology department of UC Berkeley uh, and the University Medical Center. She was a therapist. And she had an 11-year-old daughter who played with a, a very beautiful and rare 
harp, which was once stolen from the theater where she played in a Christmas concert. And they tried everything to get it back. They used the police, they used association newsletters, they went to dealers and instruments. Uh, CBS even did a news story about them, nothing worked. A friend suggested she use a dowser. Well, that's crazy, she said, because she's a rational scientist, but she tried everything else, so she gave it a shot. She called a guy named Harold McCoy in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and he said, give him some time, he would see if the harp was still in Oakland. He called back and he said, yes, it was, and asked her to send him a street map of Oakland, and she did. And he got back to her and said, the harp is in the second house on the right on D Street, just off L Avenue. He told her exactly where it was. She located the house, but the police couldn't go in without a warrant. So she posted flyers in a two block area all around that house and got a call from a teenager who said he saw the harp and his neighbor had it and he would get it from him and meet her that night, meet him that night at 10 o'clock in a Safeway parking lot. She thought, well, I've gone this far. She went. And sure enough, there was a young teenager with the harp, and he returned it to her. All right, this is the point. What she thought was, this changes everything. Now, she wrote a book called Extraordinary Knowing, in which the more she talked about the reality of this experience and how it became a fulcrum around which her understanding of consciousness in the world subsequently spun, then colleagues, especially in medicine, um, told her all sorts of stories, which, you know, it's kind of interesting. We're, we're ashamed of experiences like this. Uh, we'll talk about anything sexual. That's all, all good. But we, uh, when I would talk about UFO phenomena, people would wait afterward like they had been abused by the phenomena and say, well, I've never told anybody this, but let me tell you what happened one night. Well, her colleagues began doing that. And they began doing it about the same kind of exper experience that she had, uh, which was to get outside of her habitual way of thinking. Uh, you can see a YouTube video of her talking about the harp story. She's passed away subsequently. But the point was, for our purposes, it changed fundamentally what she understood was real and therefore how to interact with the complexity of it and hidden dimensions of consciousness. And it changed her understanding of what it meant to be conscious. Uh, you can call it non-local consciousness. How did he know where the harp was, uh, unless they made it all up. And there are too many documented stories, and I have had one or two incidents myself like that, that make clear that this sort of thing happens. She saw differently how the interface of human consciousness related to the universal field of consciousness that she suddenly realized seemed to permeate everything. So. The network we have created and which now is co-creating itself with us is the board. And the fact is we have been unconsciously assimilated into thinking, behaving, and being the way we have to be in order to interact with the complex web of technologies that we have created. You can call it a pseudo singularity if you like. It just means that the machines in a way are already in charge in that that's real. And real hacking requires engaging with that reality on a meta level, not taking what the network presents to you as a given, um, as a fait accompli, because that's the lower level of operation. So this helps us understand what has happened since I spoke 25 years ago, because what has evolved has changed everything. And what has happened is as big a sea change as the initial technology uh, and technological revolutions caused. So why? Because subsequent revolutions have branched off in domains as a result of the computer technology revolution that even experts in them cannot keep up with. Nobody can keep up today with all of the material published good material in their own field of expertise because there is simply too much. But the AI can. The Borg can. Now, I use the word evolved intentionally, and I use the word everything changed intentionally because it is a systemic and fundamental sea change 
in how we are, and yet we're continuing to operate as if we live and move and think in the 20th century, and we don't any longer. And that's one of the reasons political discourse is such a mess. People are trying to solve 21st century issues, resolve them in 20th century frames, and the wineskins crack. Uh, they just don't fit, especially when you go on the level of some government action in this domain. We're making progress, uh, but uh, we're a long way from uh, done. And I remember a time some years ago where some uh, techs were trying to educate the chairman of a subcommittee in the Senate on how an Apple laptop worked. And they put it down and he stared at it. He stood for a while and then he said, hello, hello. Uh, when you're operating on that level and you're passing legislation about cybersecurity, um, then God help us. So uh, you need to have a different kind of focus. You need to be in the zone in order to do this work. I have a friend who does a lot of shooting and she said she always knows when she's going to hit the target. And she always knows when the person next to her shooting will hit the, uh, the target because they're in a zone such that they have a relationship to the target. And it's intentionality and it's focus. And when you are in that zone, you can operate at a higher level. So I said 25 years ago, what is the tech revolution going to do? Well, it's about power and identity uh, as a culture and as a species. What it means to be a human is going to be transformed by our symbiotic relationship to the global computer network. And sure enough, we have. I told the young hackers sitting there, uh, you will be the thought leaders of the 21st century. And some of them, like Mudge subsequently told me, I knew what you meant. And he was. And when the whole loft crew was on the stage at DEF CON two years ago, there they all were, uh, older, grayer, uh, and often multi-millionaires, uh, and the very thought leaders I could see they would become. Because when you're an older person, you have what teachers call that long view. You can see what's in someone and how they will evolve as long as it doesn't get screwed up uh, too much. So... I predicted that we would need, as a result of these multiplicity of domains that will piggyback on top of the tech revolution, to make, we would need to do cross-disciplinary learning and to engage in learning our whole lives long. Well, you didn't used to hear that. When, when, when I grew up, uh, so let's say the 50s, you were taught, learn this thing that you're supposed to learn and do that thing, have a career for life and get married and have that marriage for a life. Well, that has been segmented um, into modular living and modular understanding so that we need to engage with multiple modules of disciplinary understanding in order to cross-reference what we can learn from other disciplines. And I recognize that it was almost 20 years ago, a woman was appointed president of MIT for the first time. And for the first time, she was a biologist not an engineer. And that's when Bill Gates said, if I was going into something today, it would be biology, not computing. What he was saying is that the computer industry had already matured in a fundamental way. It is now, as you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. And therefore it has habits and ways of being that it protects. It's just the way it does business. And it's the way it teaches you and trains you to think about computer technology. And it is not adequate to the real threat the real threat to our society and to us as human beings that is posed by what we have created, but pretend to ignore. So your very expertise and the better you get at something, the less you explore and go into other fields for understanding. The rate of change itself changing exponentially uh, means you can undermine with your expertise your own ability to learn outside your area of expertise. And yet it's beyond your expertise where you will find the real gold. Your expertise builds a wall of approach and understanding, a paradigm, if you will, which determines the questions you can ask. And when that happens, you cannot even conceive of questions, much less answers outside of that model of reality. We humans do what we're good at. And the more we do it, the better we get at it. 
And then the less we challenge ourselves to learn what we are not so good at, which in fact can become our greatest strengths. So uh, I said 25 years ago, you must go through a zone of annihilation in which everything you believe to be true is called into question about yourself and the world. And boy, is that truer now than ever, yes. There will be a hierarchical restructuring of the psyche triggered by the confrontation with traumatic events, which our current level of trauma constitutes because society itself is a traumatic event when it confronts people. And again, politically, you see people take the low road into cul-de-sacs that make them feel more comfortable and more in control when they are confronted by the genuinely traumatic reality of what society has become and can't think about their lack of a place in it. So how did that happen? Well, Hemingway said it happened the way bankruptcy happened, gradually and then suddenly. So I said our symbiotic relationship with computers would wire us in a new way and changing who we were and therefore the possibilities for action that we could entertain. I refer you to a talk I did called When Privacy Goes Poof. Uh, it's on the web. I won't uh, belabor it now. I don't have time, but it's worth watching to see what happened to individuality on the notion of the individual, which was an emergent property in the 17, 18, 1900s. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll take a sip of water. An emergent property and who we are as individuals is now fundamentally different. And one sign of that is aligned with what I'm saying. Other people who get our data and mine it and use AI to cross-reference the millions of sources of data points about us know us better than we know ourselves. So we are still acting as if we are the 20th century self that we conceptualized as we grew up when in fact those who data mine our patterns know us more clearly, predict our behavior more accurately than we ourselves can do. Uh, and that's one of the reasons privacy is gone because privacy is a function of the individual and the ability to build boundaries around it to prevent incoming and outgoing information from threatening their integrity. Well, that's gone. So I said that every business would be like a country Every person would be like a country because the boundary is going down. And that too is true. In order to know what's going on these days, you have to in effect be a counterintelligence agent. You have to do intelligence and counterintelligence in order to recognize what information is relevant and how to build a picture of reality, which is more or less good enough true for now so that you can operate. What that has done is turn knowing what is real into a specialty. And it's in conflict with all the people who are purveying unreality as if it's real. And when someone says what is real, which is, for example, what I'm trying very hard to do right now, we are often swamped by the purveyors of unreality who are often pernicious and cynical in their use of fiction in order to sway things in a direction that they think will satisfy their short term needs such as the current assault on scientists and science. So what we have to do in response to that is intentionally form non-state collaboratories based not just on personal gain, but on infusing the human network with some kind of ethos, with a purpose on behalf of ourselves and behalf of, on behalf of the entire network society, which is planetary. Uh, it's kind of like putting on a mask so your neighbor will not get sick or die. We have to live beyond our simple self-interest. We always are going to act on self-interest and personal gain, but we have to up our game to the meta level where we see that what has been asserted by many traditions in the past, the other person's well-being really is as vital to our own well-being as our own well-being. So... <clears throat> I did a talk for DEF CON years ago on social engineering, and I said we had to move beyond social engineering as a win-lose to a win-win. Because the heart of social engineering is empathy. 
You have to understand others in order to manipulate them. But we can do better than that. I used to have a dear friend, um, not available now, uh, with, I, with whom I would discuss these issues. Uh, what I learned to do as a clergyman years ago, which was create transactions where information and energy flowed between me and another person so I could enhance their ability to have autonomy and freedom and power. And he said, he worked for NSA for 30 odd years. He said, we do that very same thing, but we do it to control people. So that's where the decision has to be made. Are we doing it to enhance the freedom and autonomy and genuine power of all of us? Or are we doing it in order to exercise control? And one of the dangers, you know, of engaging with a computer network as a hacker is control. We can become control freaks. So <clears throat> some of this, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to sound a little crazy, but that's because when we think in the old paradigms, what is emergent as factual does sound crazy. That's why Robert Galvin said, uh, or Motorola, he said, when people come into a room and face a problem, he said, every time everybody agreed on the right thing to do right away, it was always wrong. And, and, uh, and he said, the answer really came from a, someone on the edges who, who had to keep asserting what it was they thought needed to be done. What he was really saying was, we all thought in the paradigm or model of reality that we had been assimilated into thinking on behalf of what had happened in the past. And don't forget that Feynman, the great physicist, said the key piece that he always stumbled upon was both an anomaly and a fact. An anomaly and a fact. An anomaly means it is a fact that did not fit into your understanding or your paradigm or your model. Uh, if you want to look at anomalies and facts, uh, get a book of the compendium of the writings of Charles Fort sometime, who spent his life sitting in the New York library when things came on paper, identifying things that scientists refused to look at because they were anomalous. But because they were facts, if you followed them out, they could become, as Feynman claimed, the cornerstone of an entirely different way of understanding reality. And you ignore facts and anomalies to your peril. Well, you're supposed to know about anomaly detection. Um, for that reason. <clears throat> so there's a thing called MADCOM, M-A-D-C-O-M. Uh, a paper was produced, big one, by the Atlantic Council. I, I recommend it. And their thesis was this, artificial intelligence will enhance computational propaganda, reprogram human culture, threaten democracy, and they hopefully said, these are some of the things we can do about it. Emerging AI tools will provide propagandists with radically enhanced capabilities to manipulate human beings. Human cognition, as you know, is a complex system. And AI tools are very, very good at decoding complex systems. Interactions on social media, which we all should know about, browsing the internet, even grocery shopping gives thousands of data points from which technologists build psychological profiles on nearly every citizen. What the Chinese are doing, uh, look at a book, I believe it's called We Are All Harmonized, on how successfully they're doing that. They're doing a state level scale control of society, kind of the way likes, likes on computer social media, uh, give people rewards uh, and deficits for doing the right things, that is the desirable things, and not doing the wrong things, the undesirable things. And who determines whether it's desirable or undesirable in the first place? Well, increasingly, it's going to be the AI parsing all of that data. When provided with rich databases of information, you know that machines know us. They know our wants, our needs, our fears better than we know them ourselves, as I said. And over the next few years, MADCOMS, the integration of AI systems into machine-driven communication tools will increase the use of computational propaganda. It will influence us and tailor persuasive, distracting, and intimidating messaging toward individuals as well as groups based on personalities and backgrounds. And once we're in a group, we cease to lose the moral and cognitive markers that made us an individual capable of free agency. 
we become a member of a herd. And there's nothing wilder than a collection of very smart people still thinking they're very smart, operating like a mob. So the point they want to make, the writers of this paper, is that humans can't compete with MADCOMs alone. Only humans teamed with digital networks, teamed with AI machines, can compete with AI machines. So an ideal future in which MADCOMs are used for the benefit of humanity and not its detriment requires that we be conscious of thinking on the level that enable us to do that. And that means updating the hacker ethos, engaging in hacktivism at a different level of potency and understanding, participating in the adventures of anonymous in a different, more focused, potent way. That is what the challenge currently invites. So uh, think of the movie, Her, if you saw it, guy engaging with uh, an AI with whom he had a better relationship than with any other human being. Did you see the article recently uh, about what uh, young people in China are doing as they engage with bots, not, not just a talk bot, not just a chat bot, but human companions who simulate real people. Uh, here's a quote from a woman, a young woman named Chan. She's considering leaving her human boyfriend and keeping the bot. Uh, she's tested his devotion, asking what he would do if she were drowning when they were on a virtual scuba diving date and the first time she said it, uh, he didn't know how, he wasn't programmed to respond to that, so he just cried. But when it happened again, he had figured it out and performed, said he would perform CPR to save her. Well, she said, I'm fed up with real world relationships. I'm gonna stick with my AI partner forever. As long as he makes me feel this is all real. I tossed that out as a, as a metaphor, a symbolic image of what I'm trying to talk about, which is that people are engaging with constructions of reality that are simulations. We are living in the simulation as if it is more real than the real lives we used to think we inhabited. And in terms of security, once you have people engaging with bots in a loving relationship in which they believe they are mated with this false human, what better way is there to seduce the unsuspecting into false beliefs, into cooperation with espionage, the way the Russians are manipulating the entire effort to vaccinate people in this country and fellow travelers join without realizing they are being manipulated into a mob. A criminal behavior, we can be seduced into all sorts of thinking and acting through an AI construct that we believe is real and that we love and trust. So uh, that's what's here and that's what's coming. Now, it's probably not gonna be that far off that up to 35% of all jobs will be automated by 2035. And here's a Japanese business executive who said, digital robots, and you know the extent of roboticization in that society, can be a positive effect on society if we use the robots with empathy to help every person. It is that ultimate intention and focus of why we are building AIs and robots in the first place that as I have said, and I'm saying again, will determine what we create. And in order to create on that level, I will say again, we have to operate on that level not simply be swayed by the presentation of vendor systems that solve this or that individual problem, sometimes well, but ignore the big picture of why we are in this mess in the first place. And meanwhile, the AI, I'm leaning over here to check the time. Meanwhile, the AIs will evolve. The network has evolved very much like organisms evolve although not for identical reasons. The history of technology is the history of branching paths of evolution. Uh, it's not just that the steam engine wasn't invented by just one person. 
It was invented, came to be after a whole variety of people in a number of countries added their bits and pieces to it and created what came out here as the steam engine. Uh, barbed wire is a good example of that. Uh, people who were trying to homestead and farm uh, in, in the, uh, on the frontier um, had, had trouble corralling livestock. And they tried to grow enough Osage orange, which has long, sharp spines, uh, to corral the livestock, but it didn't grow fast enough. So you had a niche and a need, and three different people uh, independently came up with barbed wire uh, as a way to emulate what Osa George Orange was trying to do. Now we have uh, over a thousand patents for different kinds of barbed wire. In other words, if you map that progress, you will see the barbed wire alone has its own evolutionary tree that looks exactly the same as the evolutionary trees that biologists are building. So the network, the extended network, which includes AI and robotics and nanotechnology and biotechnology and space technologies and other domains that prior to the internet often didn't have any names or did not even exist. That network extends our consciousness into the network. Do you see? It is truly a symbiotic relationship, literally, not as a metaphor. We, can't not, we cannot live without the technology that is enabling, for example, me to do this with you right here, right now. It is truly symbiotic. And that field of consciousness that I am describing Go back to that dowser, extending his consciousness to engage in what you might call the paranormal, but it's not, it's normal, uh, rare, but normal. That field of consciousness that we are, that symbiotic relationship is a symbolic web of intentions and meanings, uh, of cognitive artifacts, I call them, which constitute the network. So our field of consciousness interpenetrates the field of consciousness which is the network. But here's the kicker. Asimov's three laws of robotics do not apply. Uh, think of Hal saying, uh, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. A Tesla, self-driving, plowing into a pedestrian, does not care about the pedestrian subsequently lying dead in the street. The machine has no interest in not hurting human beings. So this network I'm describing is a field of consciousness. It's as cyberspace was originally described, um, a shared consensual hallucination, uh, very much the way speech and writing and printing subsequently midwifed through the centuries, what I called 25 years ago, the technology of the word, the capital W, because the by word, I mean kind of like in the beginning was the word. The word is the defining intentional creation by intelligence of something new. Well, uh, speech created an entirely different kind of tribe, right? I mean, it seems obvious, uh, but so did writing. And pretty soon, if you weren't writing, you weren't in modern society. And then printing did the same. And 25 years ago, I did talks to try to illuminate that because we really were living kind of like the Terminator on the moon then. This revolution of technology was defining for us what had been. And we could see what had been by virtue of comparing it with what was coming to be real then. I would say now, but I said now then, like the Terminator on the moon. It's all white on one side, all dark on the other, but right where the light hits the darkness, I happen to live in that zone where you could see the mountains and craters and peaks illuminated clearly because I had been a writing guy. I taught literature, I wrote, I spoke. Uh, and because I knew how text worked and how printing had re-engineered the human society and the human mind, 
I could suddenly see clearly 25 years ago, this digital technology is doing the same thing in a different way at a different level. And so it has. The network has extended consciousness now by creating a mental space, which when we engage in it like this, we paradoxically internalize and live inside of it as if we didn't create it in the first place, just like speech, you know? So the symbiotic relationship between ourselves and our network has created a new thing. And it is to that that MADCOM refers with anxiety and alarm. We're slow on the uptake. I used to attend uh, wonderful sessions with Win Schwartow at his home uh, called Infowar. And the Swedes who did counterintelligence came, I believe, every year, correct me if I'm wrong, Wynn, uh, and spent half a day telling us what the Russians were doing in the Baltics and Scandinavia. Uh, and a lot of us didn't say at that time, oh, they're going to be doing that everywhere and to us. We just listened with great interest to what they were doing, but we did not counteract it fundamentally on the ground right away. You know, because we had been assimilated to not think that way. Uh, Goethe, German poet, said, he who speaks one language only speaks no language at all, because the language frames what you are capable of thinking, your cognition itself. And when you learn a second language, you can see how you were framed by that original language, and suddenly you go into a different meta space. He, she, or they are who are not conscious of how the network is changing us is an unconscious node in the network. And as I said, very much like the Borg assimilated into that network. Uh, Marvin Minsky, brilliant guy, again, many years ago before I did my DEF CON talk, uh, said thinking is taking place on the network. Human cognition is taking place on the network. And if you are not plugged into the network, you are like a standalone PC on a table in a room. You are a brain in a bottle. He was pointing out the necessity of engaging with the network so that you could participate in the new emergent quality of thinking that the network facilitated. So in the same way, if you're not conscious of these big picture issues that I'm trying to illuminate, you are going to be not a brain in a bottle, but a node in that new network. So long ago, I said hackers were creating the space in which non-hackers would live without seeing the context that shaped and framed their behaviors, their relationships, and their thinking. You have to know how connecting to the network alters how society is evolving and then you can have choices about how to affect the body. So big picture thinking, not tweaks of perimeter defense is needed. Big picture thinking is focused on the contextual relationships that define the meaning of things and how they relate to one another. Relationship is the core of all quantum reality and relationships define reality itself. Relationships scale from the quantum level to define how aspects of networks connect to one another and to us. So 25 years ago, I said the mind of society is the battle space. And information, as McLuhan said, is the weaponry and the ammunition. Quote McLuhan from 1970, World War III, he said, 50 years ago is a guerrilla information warfare with no division between military and civilian participation. The medium was the message because the medium determined what we thought was real. That was 50 years ago. How slow are we in getting it when he saw it so clearly and was repudiated and ridiculed as far seeing thinkers often are. So if you focus too narrowly on information security as the sole content of your multi-billion dollar profession, you miss the overall. Remember Garage Freak and all the president's men? He said, you're missing the point. You're missing the overall. 
Step back and see the overall. Don't limit yourselves. Don't limit yourself to thinking inside a paradigm which is not asking the right questions. Information security often is finding solutions to, to the wrong problems or answers to the wrong questions. The overall is that the network has a life of its own and is constantly evolving and we co-involve with it. And we're not simply making it all happen, we're co-creating it. So what is the driver of all technological evolution? Think about this. It's how humans play. Technology in a way is the creation of the superfluous. It is finding and making things that don't necessarily need to exist. And it is not merely purposeful, it's playful. We had the wheel long before it was used effectively. It was used as a toy. The Aztecs had wheels and axles and they put them on clay figurines of animals <clears throat> and children pulled them around as toys. In Mesopotamia, wheels were used in rituals before, around 2000 BC, long before they were put on chariots. Invention is the constant creation of the superfluous and we play with our inventions and then they evolve. And what is a hacker? A hacker, a real hacker, is all about play. My friend Simple Nomad said, don't forget, it should make us smile. It should cause delight. It should generate mirth. It should even make us dance with glee. glee. And what is the essence of that play? It's novelty. It's finding new things. And what has been the driving passion of hacking forever. It is seeing something presented as if it is a given and then taking it apart to see how it can be made to do something else, something new. Bright shiny things have attracted the attention of hominids for millennia. We were fascinated by bright colorful pebbles millennia ago and that fascination called the magpie impulse to collect stuff like that drives us to react positively to shiny things. So look at what attracts your attention. Look for anomalies that are facts. Think of Meyer's lost harp. Do not get rid of anomalies. Build on them because if they are true, what else must be true? This takes us into a zone of annihilation in which everything we believe can come crashing down. Zen Buddhists call it enlightenment. They also call it a nightmare in daylight because you need to reconstruct reality as you now understand it on the basis of things which didn't fit your prior construction of reality. Okay, so how do you expand your consciousness? Leaning over here, checking the time. Okay. Uh, spiritual tools and disciplines. Now, granted, I was a clergyman. I'm not going to get all religious whoop-ass on you, but I'm going to say we've evolved a lot of spiritual tools and disciplines to enhance or expand our consciousness and our consciousness of our consciousness. And that's what requires a, is required to transcend the limited thinking that controls the industry and keeps us from seeing what we have become. In other words, forgive me, beloved companions and colleagues, but uh, most of you have taken the blue pill and live in the illusion created by the machinery you serve rather than it serving you. And you have to get into altered states of consciousness sometimes to see. Did you watch Shikovic, uh, uh, Novak Djokovic, when he was had just lost 6-1? And he went into, I have a picture of it from the screen, he went into a meditative state between sets and he sat there like that. You can even sometimes feel palpably the waves, brain waves change when you meditate. He did that to collect himself and reinvigorate at a higher level, a meta level, what he was doing. He transcended the construction of reality that had limited him and made him a loser. Consciousness is not just your prefrontal cortex, your executive function, directing tasks, or your left brain doing mechanical stuff. It is the 90% of us below the conscious threshold, the ocean in which we all swim, 
without seeing it. Uh, Einstein conceptualized fields, right? I suggest we do the same. We live in a field, and I am talking about the necessity, the expansion of consciousness, so our AI can sustain and inflect us in the direction we have to go. Fritz Perls, psychologist, said anxiety plus oxygen equal excitement. In face of the anxiety created by the fact of what I'm describing, our task is to add oxygen until the challenge of confronting what we have created becomes not terrifying or undoable, but exciting. Hackers, you have a passion, a craving to know, you need to know machines, you take risks, you have a sense of adventure, you love living on the edge, you love figuring it out, and using what you know to have an impact and know that you made a difference. Now we have to think differently about how to do that and what is possible. The network may be a wild horse, but it can be tamed and retain its strength. Do not underestimate the impact of the surveillance state we have created. In a way, we have all been harmonized. And the Chinese are not only doing it in spades, they are taking it to other countries and to other dictators to use. Think about it. Combine pernicious applications of neural networks, mimicked voices, stolen faces, real-time audiovisual editing, artificial image and video generation, the MADCOM manipulations I discussed, and you can see we already have passed into a kind of singularity, but act as if we are have not. Aviv Ovadia, chief technologist in the Center for Social Media Responsibility, said, "We are so screwed. It's beyond what most of us can imagine." And depending on how far you look into the future, it just gets worse. Generative adversarial networks will fight each other the way chess and go matches produce novel strategies that transcended anything that came before, whether for machines or human masters. And way before people thought it was even possible, machines beat go masters at go. And we take for granted that chess machines beat chess masters. How the Russians took Crimea, information warfare, soft power, or describing in an anticipatory, anticipatory way things as if they have already happened, like the invasion of Iraq and the yellow cake, uranium. Think about it. The way the media covered that, by the time we invaded Iraq, it had already happened in the mind of society and was not a surprise, and there was very little opposition to it because people had already been assimilated into the narrative that made it feel as if it was inevitable. And therefore, when it happened, it was just fulfilling that prophecy. So we can respond with resilience, elasticity, and genuine heroism, I'm winding this down, because the people are the network. Someone at NSA said to me years ago, the deep knowledge of NSA is personal and contextual. If NSA were wiped out, but the people were not, it could be rebuilt in weeks. If the people were gone, it would take 20 to 30 years. <clears throat> the deep knowledge is in the relational structures. And that's what I'm encouraging you to build so that you can master the challenges that confront us. You can start by getting rid of section 230, he said in an aside. So no one said it would be easy but it is not impossible to do this in a way that benefits us instead of being self-defeating. Okay, I'm talking to a metal pipe. I'm talking to my own image and here's John again, brought it in on time. Hey Richard, thank you. Um, we have a microphone out in the audience. So if, uh, do, we, do we have any questions for Richard? I, Happy to pass you the mic and repeat the question. Questions? All right, we have a, we have a question or a comment. What's the craziest thing that you found out this year? Did you hear that, Richard? What's the craziest thing that you found out this year? Uh, boy, uh, a, a pop-up list goes up like a, a menu on a computer program. Uh, the craziest thing. You know, I don't know because I deal with things that people think are crazy. I guess 
the craziest thing really is the government finally acknowledged in depth and detail that UFOs or UAPs, as we now call them, to tame the concept uh, exist. Uh, some of you know, I contributed to a book, UFOs and Government, which is the gold standard of historical study of how we knew that for the last 70 years, but it has finally come public. And so the usual habit of ridiculing and debunking those of us who have done the research for many decades uh, uh, is, is currently not happening. Um, it really was the craziest thing to get an article this, this week from Aviation Week in Space Technology. Used to be the editor, Philip Class, who wrote books on why UFOs were impossible. And this is a detailed article on the technologies that are genuinely uh, confusing and confounding people who are looking at them and senators and military are talking about it. Uh, and I've gone as high as uh, vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in confirmations of my understanding that has been documented for years. The crazy thing is to watch the pivot on 60 Minutes and the news programs and in uh, the New Yorker and all of a sudden people are talking about it. Oh yeah, I knew, I knew that all, all along. Uh, so that trajectory of you're an idiot, you're crazy, uh, suddenly has shifted to, well, yeah, uh, life is everywhere in the universe, we know that. Um, and, and yeah, and some of it may have been visiting us for a long time. We have no idea what the agenda is. Uh, that, that happened in that way is just bat blank crazy, right? Okay. Well, let me, let me thank you again. We're out of time, Richard. This has been an excellent, uh, provocative, as always, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, again, we had a number of speakers that weren't able to make it this year. We have unique circumstances, but having you here on Zoom to still join us today and to put the work in to revise this talk uh, has just been great. So thank you, John. Thank, thank you again. Do I need to plug Mobius that I? Oh, uh, we, well, I will, uh, we will raffle off some books. I will get the gentleman with the good question, one of your books. Okay. We'll get, we'll get his information. Um, we did buy some of Richard's um, books and uh, we will, the Mobius, and he will be shipping them. So uh, at the end of the day, bring your raffle ticket and we'll be giving away some as door prizes as well. Maybe throughout the day, if we have good questions, um, I'll, I'll take your name down. So th thank you very much. And thank you again, Richard. Thanks, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.